Chloe has just performed on stage for the first time. She is now back home and is recalling how it all began. What a fluster I was in when I first went out onto the stage. I still have such a long way to go before I can dance like a star. Chloe decides to write her first dancing instructor to tell her all about the show, but above all, to tell her how much progress she has made. In part one, we shall be following Chloe's career and we'll discover that classical ballet has a very precise vocabulary all of its own and that it is essential to learn the basics. Then, in part two, we shall see how a dance lesson is structured. The human body can be used to express an extraordinarily wide range of emotions. The dancer uses her body to express her art. Classical ballet is a complete mastery of natural movement. The gracefulness achieved by a dancer is a result of the elegance of each of her movements. Constant repetition of each movement working within the limitations of the dancer's body is the only way of achieving this degree of purity and elegance. Dance exercises are designed to simultaneously develop stamina, suppleness, a sense of balance and lightness, and the strength and breadth of the performer. It is a balance between all these qualities which creates harmony and a perfect mastery of the various movements. Dear teacher, yesterday I found a trunk in the loft which is full of dance costumes and pictures. I realise that I have no idea where classical ballet originated. Dancing goes back long before history began. People have always liked singing and dancing, and they have constantly invented new dances. Classical ballet, however, is closely linked to the history of Western civilization. Young girls begin their classical ballet training when they are eight. This is the age when they have a natural aptitude, but can still be easily moulded and corrected. Before then, younger pupils can be made aware of their own bodies and how to move in the games which are played in the beginner's classes and initial training. By studying the basics, you will become aware of the main positions of different parts of the body, the basic movements, the different alignments or directions, arabesques. But just why do people dance? People dance to express themselves, to show their joy or their sorrow, to bring on rain or sunshine, or to make themselves feel better, to celebrate a birth, a marriage, or even a funeral, or people get together to dance, just for fun. Hands have their own special form of expression. There are two main positions. The hand at rest is neutral and relaxed, with the thumb well down. When the hand is outstretched, the palm faces downwards. The fingers are delicate and straight. Hands can be very emotive. The agility, fluidity and suppleness displayed by the fingers gives the hand its eloquence and it can convey the subtlest of feelings.
arms help a dancer keep her balance and can also be very expressive. The arms can reflect a dancer's feelings. Careful attention must be paid to all three joints which form the arm, the shoulder, the elbow and the wrist to ensure that arm movements are smooth. All come into play as the arm strokes the air or bend round to form a rounded or elongated shape. Rules governing arm movements are very precise. There is a preparatory position called bras en repos and five other positions. Bras en repos is both a starting and finishing position and various arm movements pass through the rest position. In bras en repos, the curve of the arms is maintained and both arms are brought together in the front as low as possible. The hands are very close together. The first position evolves from bras en repos, the curve of the arms being maintained, as well as the distance between the hands. The arms are raised to the level of the navel or waist level. Second position continues on from first position. The arms are opened up to the sides, just slightly below the shoulder line. The elbows are held up and the hands outstretched. Third position continues from the second position. One arm is lifted into the air to fifth position with the palm facing the body and the other remains to the side or a la seconde. In fourth position, one arm remains in fifth position, whereas the other takes up first position with the forearm close to the chest. In fifth position, both arms are curved and lifted above the head and are gently tilted forward. The shoulders remain low. The palms of the hands face the floor. I wonder how people danced before there was a court or theatres, before people learned how to write. And then there's the music. Hand clapping gave the first dances their beat. If you watch any folk dances anywhere in the world, it is easy to imagine what dancing was like a long time ago. When the head is held high, it presents a nice profile. It can move in various directions, and these are often combined. It can be lifted up, it can face downwards, it can turn from side to side, and it can be tilted.
combination most commonly found in classical ballet is the head which is turned and tilted. Six basic head positions correlate with other movements by the body. When walking normally, the head is held straight and erect. When the dancer takes a step forward, the head movement accompanies the movement of the working leg. It echoes the direction in which the leg is moving by turning gently towards the shoulder on that side. When the dancer moves backwards, however, the motion of the head contrasts with the movement made by the working leg, gently turning to face the opposite direction to the direction in which the leg is moving. The movement known as the Grand de Jambe à terre en dehors, in which the leg traces an outward round on the floor away from the body, from fourth devant at the front to fourth derrière at the back, the head faces the working leg as it begins to move and remains in that position. When the movement begins from behind and moves inwards towards the body, in the rond de jambe en dedans, the head turns away from the working leg as it begins to move and gradually turns inwards so that it faces the same direction as the working leg when the movement comes to an end. In this particular rond de jambe, there is a special combination of head and leg movements. At the beginning of the rond de jambe en dehors, the head turns away from the leg tracing the shape on the floor and turns back so that it is once again facing the working leg during the rond de jambe en dedans. When a dancer turns, the head is the last part of the body to go into the turn and the first to complete the turn and come back to face the audience. During a pirouette, the head is held very erect. The various head movements only have the desired effect if the dancer learns how to control her facial expressions so that they prolong or anticipate each action and give the meaning to each movement which the artist wishes to convey. A dancer should never betray any signs of pain or of the physical effort involved in her face, nor should she on any account show any signs of boredom or any other feeling which is inappropriate to the dance being performed. Dancing is an act of giving. Dancers offer the very best of themselves, and the most important thing is to share the pleasure of dancing with others. A dancer's eyes should be bright and clear, and her expression both lively and at the same time demure. Like any other form of art, dancing is an act which is carried out for other people's enjoyment. When a dancer appears on stage, she needs to look directly at her audience in order to establish a rapport. She must look straight ahead without seeming to stare. A dancer uses her body to create various movements and her eyes often echo the movement by following the movement of her hands. She can look up or down or to either side. 
She can also use her eyes to express her feelings. People must have danced barefoot at the very beginning. So who was it who invented demi-points? The Greeks invented demi-points in the third century. They used them to perform a position which we could perhaps call an arabesque bass or a low arabesque. The back leg was lifted off the floor to calf level. The Romans loved the step and considered it to be the very symbol of dance. Demi-points later became fashionable in France and are now worn by classical dancers the world over. The human body has a centre of equilibrium. A dancer has only her body to rely on to perform her art. Being properly placed means keeping the body quite straight along its central axis. This posture is frequently described as being pulled up, and some dancers imagine that they are suspended by a thread at the top of their head. The torso links all four limbs, and it has to be both strong and supple. When the dancer is standing upright, the torso is squarely balanced on both legs. There are four basic movements of the torso. Bends to each side. Ponche en avant, or forward bends. and rond the core or twisting the body round. And when did points first appear? In the 19th century, ballerinas were aiming for a feeling of lightness and lift, as if their bodies were ephemeral, like water vapour or clouds. And this is what prompted the forerunner of present-day points. In those days, points were shoes made of soft material and the toes were padded with cotton wool. The dancer held herself up through muscle power and a sense of balance. skills acquired in classical ballet make a dancer's legs look like fleeting arrows, which are supple and expressive. Leg positions are defined by referring to three fixed points. Fourth devant to the front, a la seconde, or second position, to the side. And fourth derriere, at the back. Fourth devant. Fourth devant ponte. Here the dancer begins with her feet in the fifth position. She transfers her weight onto her back foot, lifts the heel of her front foot, and arches her foot, keeping the tip of her toes on the floor. Fourth devant à demi hauteur. Moving from fourth devant ponte, the dancer lifts her leg 50 centimeters off the floor. Fourth devant à la hauteur, in a développé 
or slow unfolding movement, the leg is raised to hip level. second. Second pointe. Starting from the second foot position, the body weight is transferred from both feet to the supporting leg, freeing the working leg, which the dancer then points towards the side, keeping the tip of her toes on the floor. Second à la demi hauteur. This follows on from second pointe as a working leg is lifted to a point halfway between the floor and hip level. Second à la hauteur. From fifth position, the outstretched leg is raised to an angle of 90 degrees. Fourth position derrière. Fourth position derrière pointe. The dancer begins in the fifth foot position. She transfers her weight onto her front foot so that the back leg is free to point backwards, keeping the tip of the toes on the floor. Fourth derrière à demi hauteur. Moving from fourth position derrière pointe. The leg is then raised at an angle of 45 degrees. Fourth derrière à la hauteur. Slowly unfolding her leg in a développé, she continues to lift her leg up until it is level with her hips. Notice that in all these leg positions, the leg is fully extended right down to the toes and the knees are quite straight. must have invented all the movements and positions in classical ballet at some time, and it would have to have been a dancer who drew up all the rules we learn today, and which have applied for so many years. The evolution of classical ballet was mainly due to the work of just one man, Charles-Louis Pierre de Beauchamp. He played a very important role in the development and classification of the techniques of classical ballet. It was Beauchamp who introduced all the basic positions. He was dance master and composer of ballet to His Majesty the Sun King, a title he used for all the court ballets from 1655 onwards and for all the dance comedies of Molière. For Beauchamp, ballet meant taking the natural movement and developing it as far as possible so that it became artificial. The entrechat, for example, was originally a small jump in which the legs beat against one another. 
when the feet also changed position during the jump in what is now known as a changement battu, the entrechat became an entrechat royal. The number of changements battu can be increased to four or six to give an entrechat quatre or entrechat six. And these were performed by Camargo in 1730. Hedzinski later excelled at performing entrechat with as many as eight or ten changements battu. The whole repertoire of movements of the classical school in which the principle of good turnout predominates are the results of this analysis. The various footwork exercises are designed to make the feet firm, supple, flexible and fast. A dancer's feet have to support the whole weight of her body and if she's going to dance well, go up on point, jump and achieve good balance, her feet have to be very strong. Strong supple feet prevent accidents from happening and guard her against ankle injuries, which is the thing dancers fear the most. Five basic positions for the feet. First position, the heels are just touching and the toes face away from one another, on the oar. Everyone talks about on the oar all the time. But what does the term mean exactly? On the or, or turnout, is a vital part of classical ballet technique. It is the ability to rotate the entire leg right through to the tip of the toe, through 90 degrees from the hip socket. Through constant training, dancers gradually manage to achieve perfect turnout. Going back to first position, the feet remain level and the knees are kept straight as the toes are moved apart. With perfect turnout, the feet form a completely straight line. Second position. Moving from first position, the body weight is transferred to one leg. The heel of the other leg is gradually raised so that the stretched foot can slide across to the side. Once the legs are about a foot length apart, the heel is brought down to the floor and the body weight evenly distributed over both feet. Third position. Moving from second position, the dancer lifts her heel, points her foot, and then slides her heel over to bring her foot behind or in front of the other foot, with the heel of her front foot touching the middle of her back foot. Fourth position. Starting from third position, the front foot moves forward from the back foot by about a foot length. The heel rises so that the leg can move forward, with the toes still touching the floor. Both feet are then turned out. Fifth position. To reach fifth position from fourth, the dancer lifts one heel, keeping her toes on the floor. Her foot remains in its open position as it slides over to touch and then crosses in front of the other foot, so that only the tips of the toes of the back foot are visible. Students only learn the fifth foot position when they have achieved perfect placement. The most difficult thing about all the different positions of the feet is that the legs are stretched out, the knees are kept straight, and the upper body has to be relaxed. The 
position of the feet during movements. The feet can adopt five basic positions during movements. A plat, flat. The entire sole of the foot touches the ground with all the toes straight and in contact with the floor. Sur la demi-pointe. The heel is lifted up off the floor. Sur la pointe. The foot is resting on the tips of the toes in special ballet shoes known as pointes or points. Avec la pointe tendue. The leg is stretched out in the air with the ankle well turned out and the toe pointing downwards. Flex. The toe of the foot points upwards and the heel is pushed downwards, extending the muscles in the back of the leg. That is Marie Salé, who was a very daring dancer in her day. She died in 1756. She caused a sensation by not wearing a wig and a hoop petticoat. She danced as though she were dancing on air, and this soon became a very fashionable style of dancing. So dancers have also contributed to the evolution of classical ballet. Ballet could not have evolved without the passion for dance, the efforts, and the contributions of the dancers themselves. But we mustn't forget the choreographers, who create new steps and styles, and who also made their mark on the history of dance. After Beauchamp, there was the choreographer called Jean-Georges Nevers, who revolutionized ballet. He invented libretto, so that ballet became a way of telling a story. Dancing ceased to be just another form of entertainment and became an art in its own right. and greleves are the two balletic movements on which the whole technique of classical ballet are founded. Plies help to make a dancer's legs more supple and increase turnout. When a dancer jumps, she uses a plie to spring into the air and another plie to cushion her landing. Plies can be quite different. They can be quite yielding, a little firmer, very deep. A releve is a movement in which the dancer rises up onto her toes and it requires a good sense of balance. Ponches, or forward bends, are found in several different movements such as arabesques, adage in fourth devant, and la reverence. Combres, or backward bends, are strong, supple movements in which the torso bends backwards. They are very difficult to do well, and it is easy to make a false move and damage the spine. Glissé is a gliding action when dancers move lightly over the floor, evenly balancing their body weight as they move. It is a continuous movement with the feet brushing the floor, and it means that a sequence of steps or enchaînement is much easier. This gliding action also serves as the impetus for certain jumps. Sauté is the action of dynamically leaping up with apparent weightlessness. Jumps consist of three separate elements. The preparation, or detente, prior to the jump, when a demi-plié is used to gain momentum. The envolée, or the moment she begins to rise in a relevé, 
with her legs stretched out and her torso lifted up and relaxed. And the atterrissage, or landing, which is cushioned by another demi-plie. A lance, or darting, is an action performed by a dancer either before or after a movement requiring a great deal of energy, such as a jump or a turn. Turns are circular movements in which the artist changes direction. A dancer can turn on the spot, or she can move round in a circle. How did it come about that people insisted on perfection and only concentrated on the most beautiful movements? Polite society invented a way of dancing in which the body movements followed the music. In their search for beauty, they began to prescribe the various different movements as if they were a part of a musical score. The various square dances and the dances performed at court and in aristocratic circles were then taken up by the bourgeoisie who began to develop a love of beauty. Burlesque style mime was also introduced into various dances and performers wore masks and disguises. Mime had been part of court entertainment since the beginning of the 15th century and certain elements were already being introduced into ballet which would be developed even further a century later. The majority of the basic positions of ballet depend on the alignment of the dancer's body and legs in relation to her audience. The various positions defining alignment are most often encountered in adage. There are six different alignments. Crossé devant, when the legs are seen as crossed by the audience, with one leg crossing over in front. Crossé derrière, when the legs are seen as crossed by the audience, with one leg crossing over at the back. Epaule, when the leg in second position points towards the audience. Face, when the leg in second position points diagonally away from the audience. Efface devant, when the audience can see both legs and one is in front. Efface derrière, when the audience can see both legs and one is at the back. Class, you can either say that the leg is in crossé derrière or the pupil is in a crossé derrière position. understand you rightly, people have always enjoyed dancing, but when did dancers first become professional? This was in Italy in the 14th century. Professionalism first came about because Italian dancers and ballet masters wanted to raise the level of technical skill and to develop a special vocabulary. In France it didn't happen until much later, not until the end of the 17th century. But it is in fact the language of the 19th century which we have inherited today. Arabesques require a very strong back and very supple hips. The dancer supports herself on one leg and stretches the other leg behind her, a la hauteur. 
The shape of the body, the position of the arms, and the line of the raised leg are the three elements which define an arabesque. When dancers first begin to learn how to perform an arabesque, they start by extending one leg out behind, but keep the tip of the toes on the floor. There are four types of arabesque. We shall explore the different forms of arabesque in more detail later, but for now it is sufficient just to look at the four sorts of arabesque which exist. First arabesque. Second arabesque. Third arabesque. A dancer needs to be able to perform all the different forms of arabesque. In adage, with her supporting leg on demi-point or on point, in grand pirouette and in jumps. But what would dancing be without music? Music and dance are like twin sisters. They are both born and spring from within the body. They obey practically the same rules and they respond to the same demands. This is why they go so well together. Music consists of rhythms with different beats which determine the speed, a melody which gives the music colour and feeling, and cadences which are just like a grammar, in that they indicate the full stops and commas and give the music its shape. Classical ballet gives music a visible shape. Although music and dance both respond to a strict set of rules, they can have an effect on one another so that they form in a harmonious whole. This is why ballet classes work to a piano accompaniment. The pianist is always a trained musician who can respond to the requirements of the dance instructor. Although we speak of individual positions and movements, we must never lose sight of the fact that they're only elements which make up a whole. One plie on its own is not dancing. We must also never forget that every gesture has to have meaning. The same movement can be light or airy. It can stroke the air, it can cut into it, it can be jerky, it can be a whole range of different things. A dancer whose movements seem aimless or who is obviously not enjoying dancing can never become a performer. Each movement must have a precise quality assigned to it so that the dance is interpreted exactly as we want it to be and this is when a dancer is ready to appear before an audience. By dancing, we are able to tell the audience a story.
Chloe's recollections led us to the dancer of her dreams, who acted as her guide for her very first ballet steps. How beautiful she is. How lucky I was to meet her. We've even danced together. Chloe is training to become a dancer by attending a regular dance class. That's why I love ballet so much, because by regularly attending dancing classes, I can see the progress I'm making. And Chloe's journey through history will bring us right up to the classical ballet of today.